So I'm Marie Schmidt. I work for the University of Idaho in Coeur d'Alene. I'm part of the Our Gem Coeur d'Alene Lake Collaborative, which is hosting this webinar series. We have representatives from Coeur d'Alene Tribe, Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, Kootenai Environmental Alliance, Coeur d'Alene Chamber, CDA 2030, and University of Idaho. Um, I believe many of you have attended some of our other presentations uh, last week and, this, and earlier this week. So welcome back. For anybody new, um, welcome. We're hoping to hold another set of these webinars at some point in the future. Uh, the Argem Collaborative collectively writes a series of newspaper articles published in the Coeur d'Alene Press on a variety of water resource issues. So if these webinars have been of interest to you and you want to check out those articles, they are archived at our website, which is uidaho.edu slash our gem. So you can find those there. Today we have Dr. Kim Holzer. She's the invasive species specialist with the Idaho State Department of Agriculture. And as usual, we're going to keep most of the questions for the end. There is that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so you can enter questions there. If there's anything that um, will help clarify something that Kim's talking about, I can interrupt her and ask, but we'll leave most of the questions for the end. Thanks, Marie, for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk about aquatic invasive species in Idaho. I'm going to talk pretty broadly about aquatic invasive species, including some of their characteristics and how they're moved from place to place, both accidentally and intentionally. And then I'll dive into more detail on a couple of species that have not yet arrived to our state, as well as a couple that are established in Kootenai County and how we manage for them differently. I hope most of you are able to view the slides with the original photography because they are potentially the best part of this lecture. <laughs> So at a casual glance, the word invasive may seem like a synonym for lots of other adjectives that can be used to describe species status, like introduced, non-native, alien, immigrant, pest, a nuisance, exotic, foreign. However, when natural resource managers can serve this term, we're referring to species that are both non-native and cause harm to the environment economy, or human and animal health. The reality is most non-native species are actually beneficial or neutral, and relatively few warrant the designation of invasive. So directly from Idaho statute, invasive species mean, mean species not native to Idaho, including their seeds, eggs, spores, larvae, or other biological material capable of propagation that cause economic or environmental harm and are capable of spreading in the state. Invasive species does not include crops, improved uh, forage grasses, domestic livestock, or other beneficial non-native organisms. So some ways that aquatic invasive species can harm the environment are through outcompeting desirable natives, replacing biodiversity with monocultures, and otherwise degrading natural habitat quality and beauty. Aquatic invasive species can damage the economy through compromising infrastructure, especially our hydropower system and irrigation systems. They also hinder recreation and can decrease property values. Human health is negatively affected when aquatic invasive species carry zoonotic diseases or parasites um, and degrade water quality. A classic example from terrestrial systems is a plant that has a toxic sap that can cause severe burning in humans or colic when consumed by livestock. In this picture, you'll see a, a prop of a watercraft on Hayden Lake that's been clogged by the invasive plant Eurasian water milfoil. Uh, I'll talk about both intentional pathways of introduction and accidental pathways of introduction. Uh, intentional movement is less common and often motivated by good intentions, but poor foresight. Um, 
many aquatic invasive species don't move via one pathway, but multiple. So some of my examples um, are, are just a case study. They're not the definitive way that that species moves around the globe. So in, in the situation of flowering rush, which is pictured here in the Lake Ponderay system, given its beautiful pink flowers, it's no surprise that this species who's native to Eurasian, uh, sorry, Eurasia, made its way around the globe through the ornamental plant trade. Hardiness over appearance is likely an explanation for why the Asian mystery snails, also called trapdoor snails in Idaho, are so popular with Aquarius. They were likely introduced to several North Idaho lakes separately through what we call aquarium dumps without forethought about their ability to multiply. This picture is from Moose Creek Reservoir in Lataw County, but they are also very abundant in Kootenai County and Hauser Lake and in Bonner County in Round Lake. Some aquatic invasive species or non-native species are intentionally introduced by recreational anglers or even natural resource management professionals uh, with the best intention of trying to grow a new fishery. This is a northern pike in Lake Coeur d'Alene. Um, moving on to accidental pathways of aquatic invasive species introduction. Aquaculture escapees can range from the actual species that's being cultivated that escapes, for example, Asian carp, to any of the taxa that may have hitchhiked with the fish, such as snails and aquatic plants. This hydrilla specimen in the photo came from a tributary to the Snake River near an aquaculture facility in uh, Twin Falls. I think our community in North Idaho is well in tune to the risk of transporting aquatic invasive species on watercraft. Some typical places, however, where aquatic invasive species hide Kim, I think your pot, your internet's waiting to catch up. Let's try talking again. I can't hear anything you're saying. <laughs> um, let's see if we stop your video. Okay. Go I ahead. just yeah, I just see a, a warning on my screen that says my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> I stopped your video, so hopefully that will help. So um, how much did you all miss? Um, just the last maybe 20 seconds that you said. Okay. Um, I, I was talking about how our community is well in tune to the risk of transporting aquatic invasive species accidentally on watercraft, but I wanted to draw attention to some places that voters often neglect to um, search, and that is trapped between the hull and the bunk of the trailer. Uh, in standing water, such as in a sea strainer, bilge, live well, or ballast tanks, on dock lines, and also in the anchor locker. Seaplanes can also transport aquatic invasive species and are quite popular in Coeur d'Alene and surrounding lakes especially weeds on their floats. This picture is uh, from the Ponderé River and the plane is sitting on a mat of Eurasian water milfoil. Um, the good news is the Seaplane Pilots Association takes aquatic invasive species risk very seriously and has produced a series of videos and testing so that their pilots can self-certify their crafts as aquatic invasive species free prior to takeoff. In North Idaho, we pull water from lakes for many purposes, two of which call for moving the water a fair distance from the source, such as for roadway dust abatement or fire suppression. Both these practices can deposit that water in reach of another water body or the actual extraction equipment can become contaminated between water bodies. 
live bait can accidentally wiggle off your line or some anglers may dump their bait bucket at the end of a visit. In North Idaho, live swimming bait is illegal unless it's harvested at the site to eliminate this aquatic invasive species introduction risk. Pictured here is a non-native crayfish collected in Hayden Lake. It may have been introduced by a number of pathways, including live bait, but it could have been bycatch in a fish stocking event from a contaminated hatchery, or it could be somebody's pet release. The live food trade has been implicated in the escape of bullfrogs in some states, but I've not heard of a high demand for frog legs in our area. It's also possible that bullfrogs be released from personal or classroom aquaria. Unfortunately, a lot of aquatic invasive species tend to be very resilient and are good pets or good classroom specimens. So they tend to be sold to schools by biological supply companies for their use in science education. Uh, there is quite the bullfrog infestation at Round Lake State Park. The final pathway that I'll share is actually a bit whimsical. Sometimes seeds from invasive aquatic plants are incorporated into home decor, such as the case with this decorative rooster having a Phragmites tail. These roosters were sold in box stores in Coeur d'Alene and Spokane in an autumn 2017 release, but were swiftly removed from the shelves after the risk was recognized. So if any of you have one of these roosters, <laughs> turn it in. No, <laughs> just uh, be mindful. Uh, now I'll transition to talking about aquatic invasive species. Oops. That do not occur anywhere in Idaho. And uh, to and and are fair and two that are fairly widespread. Sorry for the stutter there. Um, and thank you for the art by local artist Trent Anderson. I believe he was also a watercraft inspector, which may be one of the reasons he was inspired by this theme. So zebra and quagga mussels are two invasive species that have not managed to land in Idaho waterways since their arrival into the US in 1988. They're often considered cousins taxonomically because they look similar to each other and belong to the same genus. A couple ways that you can distinguish them from native mussels is their triangular shape, which is indicated in the slide, and they have bissel threads. Bissel threads are strong silky strands used for attachment underwater and to assist with their locomotion. If you follow the arrow in this photo, you'll see that it almost looks like the muscle is wearing a beard. The shells often have a dappled or zebra stripe pattern, but not always. Zebra and quagga mussels to give you some background, were first detected in Lake St. Clair in 1988. Lake St. Clair borders Michigan and Ontario, and they spread in that same year to Lake Erie. They most likely arrived in ballast water discharge from commercial ships that had left a Eurasian freshwater port since they're native to the Black and Caspian Seas. Two years after their first discovery, they reach Lake Erie, Ontario, Huron, Michigan, and Superior. Five years later, they started dispersing along major river corridors, including the Mississippi, Hudson, and Ohio rivers. We also saw our first overland jump with dead mussels observed in the western states, and that is indicated by the black square in this map. Eight years into the invasion, they're spreading rapidly in the eastern half of the U.S., but mostly confined to the eastern side of the Mississippi. A decade later, the Missouri River has a detection, plus there are more widespread overland jumps throughout the U.S., in Canada, 
but especially in the Western states. Two thousand and seven marks a turn of events for the Western states since we have our first live mussel uncovered in Lake Mead, Nevada, which was swiftly followed by other live occurrences in the lower Colorado. By 2010, the Arkansas and Red Rivers are also invested in the quagga zebra mussel front has definitely transversed the Rockies. Flash forward to the present, this map shows the current situation. You wanna focus your attention to the red and yellow circles, which represent verified occurrences. The density is mostly in the east, and you'll notice that Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, New Mexico, Washington, and Oregon are successfully holding off the front with the help of our Canadian neighbors in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. In fact, there are no quagga zebra mussels in the Columbia River Basin. The state of Idaho responded to this invasion succession with a series of preventative actions. First, the Idaho Invasive Species Council was formed by via executive order. Then the Idaho Invasive Species Act was passed in 2008, along with companion administrative rules, giving the state authority to conduct inspections for aquatic invasive species, as well as a funding mechanism. Roadside inspections started operations in 2009, and that same year we intercepted our first muscle fouled watercraft, and the boat was ironically named Hello, as in Hello, which was not that subtle of a wake up call to the eminent risk. So 2020 marks the 12th year of our watercraft inspections for aquatic invasive species across the state. This year we have around 126,000 inspections with about half of these occurring in North Idaho's seven sites, four in Kootenai County and three are in Bonner County. For data gurus like myself, there is a website that is updated in real time with all watercraft inspection data and it can be sorted by date or by station. So you can see just the volume and the fact that we have boots on the ground um, every day. Well, from March until the end of October. Uh, moving on to aquatic invasive plant species that we've come to know, um, unfortunately, too well in North Idaho. I'll talk about curly leaf pondweed and Eurasian water milfoil. Curly leaf pondweed was first detected in Coeur d'Alene Lake in July 2018 and was believed to be constrained to the Third Street boat launch and docks around the Hagadon Resort until earlier this week. So those of you on the webinar are the first to hear this public announcement that um, earlier this week, Ben Schofield with the Coeur d'Alene Tribe found um, several plants in Windy Bay. And uh, management strategy and, and plan is, is underway as we speak. You can identify curly leaf pondweed from some lookalike species by its wavy lasagna-like leaves with the finely toothed edges. If you look closely, uh, the picture on the left, you can see there's almost serrations on the leaf margins. The plant is olive to reddish brown and has a prominent mid vein. In this picture, that mid vein is reddish. It, its reproductive structure is called a turion, and this resembles a sharp pine cone that's about, um, well, it's less than an inch in length. A single plant can be loaded with turions, as you see in this photo from Hayden Lake. So that's an important life history strategy to keep in mind when we talk about management options later on. Uh, Eurasian water milfoil arrived in Idaho in the 1990s, most likely, but early surveys may be um, incomplete. Currently, it's quite dense in the southern part of Coeur d'Alene Lake, and uh, managers are working to control smaller populations. Also at the Third Street launch in Cougar Bay, 
and Wolf Lodge, Harrison Slough, and Windy Bay. You can identify this plant by its feather-shaped leaves that are arranged in whorls of four around the stem. Uh, the filaments that make up that feather uh, we call leaflets. And this may seem almost mundane, but um, it's actually important to count the leaflet pairs to actually identify the species. So Eurasian water milfoil has greater than 12 leaflet pairs, whereas the native northern milfoil is going to have 12 or less typically. This photo from Lake Ponderay shows a specimen with 17 leaflet pairs. You'll also notice that the tip of the leaf in the Eurasian water milfoil comes to a blunt end as if someone had cut off the tip with a scissor. This species mostly reproduces by fragmentation uh, and it doesn't take much for it to regenerate from a small plate piece, maybe a one inch piece with the right node, which is another important life history trait to keep in mind when we start to talk about management. It produces flowering spikes, which can help you identify that plant. And these spikes typically break the water surface. There are many native species that are mistaken for Eurasian water milfoil. So please, if you have some uncertainty, send us a series of photos. The best thing you can do is to send a landscape style photo, like the image on the left, to show the plant in the environment, then uh, closer up. So we can start to look at the morphology and then go ahead and take it out of the lake, put it in a tub of clean lake water and um, capture a close up. If you wanna go that extra mile and help with the ID, you'll take a cross section of the plant so that you can look at the morphology of um, the leaves and the encounter leaflet pairs. And now I'll, I'll dive into the management options for these two invasive aquatic plants, which I think a lot of folks are most interested in. I certainly fantasize that management of these two invasive plants would be simpler, but to the contrary, it's very complex and the choices often have lots of trade-offs to consider. The four basic management categories are first, mechanical, which is the physical removal of the plant. The second is a biological control, which in involves using a natural enemy that specializes in its ability to damage or suppress that plant. Third, we have chemical control, which are your herbicides. Um, fourth, we have cultural control, which is a practice or behavior that inhibits or prevents that plant from thriving. These methods don't have to be used in isolation. They can be applied in a sequence or what we call in a spatial mosaic. Uh, an example of a sequence would be you have a massive infestation of dense Eurasian water milfoil. So the first year you might need a mechanical harvest just to get that biomass out of the system. The following year you use an herbicide um, to knock back the plants. Uh, maybe a systemic herbicide that gets at the roots. And then um, moving forward with that smaller population, you use divers to hand pick the sparse plants. Um, and in terms of using what I call the spatial mosaic, you might have a system where you are going to use a harvester um, in navigational corridors, which they do in the lower part of Coeur d'Alene Lake just so that we don't have a lot of fragmentation. And then also use herbicides, spot herbicides around docks or benthic barriers. But I'll talk in more detail about the different, different examples of these styles of management. And I, I, am, I am coming to the end, I think I have maybe five more minutes and I'll be able to take some questions. So I've listed um, four different mechanical removal methods from coarse to finer scale, where at the bottom, the harvester and weed rake is the most likely to cause the fragmentation, um, followed by the diver assisted suction dredge, 
that's usually when your divers arrive on a barge or pontoon boat and they're using a hookah uh, and a glorified underwater vacuum, call that dash. And then the most delicate option, although much more time intensive, is when a diver is going to hand pull individual plants. These methods are most effective when curly leaf pondweed does not have any turions, those little pine cones, and when Eurasian water milfoil is not brittle or highly susceptible to fragmenting. Uh, in, in the Coeur d'Alene River system, it's important to take note that divers may not be practical for safety reasons in lead contaminated areas. So you're just starting to get a glimpse of all these kind of pros and cons of the different methods and how they might be best um, utilized uh, in what we call an integrated pest management approach. And I hope you all can see this video. This is an example of one of those harvesters and it lowers a conveyor to the lake bed and then draws in the milfoil onto the deck and it's loaded off site somewhere that's high and dry. This work was done um, near Hebron State Park in the, in the lower part of the Coeur d'Alene Lake. Um, as I mentioned before, biological control employs natural enemies that specialize in the target and are aggressive enough to suppress the population. These can include grazers or disease agents. There are many generalist Eurasian water milfoil grazers, such as um, a milfoil weevil, a milfoil midge, caddisfly, moth larvae, snails, such as those pictured to the right, um, different fishes, birds, and others. Uh, however, the damage that they cause appears minor and none seem to control populations well outside of lab experiments. But um, this is a tool that can be used very effectively for other plants. And the example from the Coeur d'Alene Lake would be um, the use of biocontrol for the plant purple loose strife. Uh, despite carefree online promotional videos of homeowners tossing magical granules from their dock to control the weeds below, aquatic herbicide applications can be quite involved and there are actually important legal requirements to be aware of for the health of the applicator, the neighbors, and the lake itself. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about the different compounds, but I will list uh, important contact information for the regional folks who can help you with understanding uh, herbicide labels and license requirements, and also whether or not an Idaho pollutant discharge elimination permit is required. So Chuck Hawley with the Idaho State Department of Agriculture can help with label and license questions, and Wes Green with the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality can help with permit questions. The photo on the right is from a Procellicore application which is a specialized herbicide for um, Eurasian water milfoil that occurred last month, actually. Uh, examples of cultural practices that can deter plant growth um, are lake drawdown. I know uh, Idaho Fish and Game has the ability to change levels in, in the river and the chain lakes. Um, most homeowners, however, do not have the ability to change lake levels, but it may be a good tool if they have a small private pond. Um, one other option for um, property owners on the lake is that you can strategically place what we call bottom barriers, uh, which is a, a sort of mulching of the lake bed. Um, and you deploy these barriers. Um, it's easiest when the lake is drawn down. Uh, and the light isn't able to access the lake bed and you don't have any plant growth. Um, per Idaho Department of Land specifications, these barriers cannot be more than 10 feet by 10 feet. And there is an annual land use permit required to the tune of, a, I think, $25. Uh, your point of contact from the Idaho Department of Lands is Amity Fusen. 
and she can help with um, permit questions. Um, I guess similar to mulching in some ways, uh, there is still uh, some maintenance involved when you lay down or deploy a barrier. These often require what um, we call uh, burping, uh, which is um, just releasing big gas bubbles from um, either decomposition or just uh, carbon production. And also they need to be flipped periodically throughout the season, especially in areas where you have um, a lot of sediment loading because what can happen is you just have a layer of sediment on top of your barrier that the plants can grow on. Um, with that, I'll leave you a picture of Harrison Slough in a very beautiful um, decoy and take any questions that you have. Okay, thank you, Kim. So again, um, Anybody who has questions, feel free to put those in the question Q&A box at the bottom. And you can also chat those to me if that's easier. Uh, I had a really quick question, Kim. On the map where it's showing, um, I guess you'd say the historic finds of zebra and quagga mussels across the US, there was a one of those black boxes that indicated the dead species found and it looked like it was in Eastern Washington, maybe. Do you know where that was? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I just hadn't realized they'd found them that close to home. So that was interesting. Um, and I also, uh, I believe a few years ago, maybe even like five or more years ago, they um, they had found some potentially some mussels in. Montana, do you know about right. that? Were those found to be actually be zebra or quaggas? Um, that detection was made with genetic tools. And so it was a preventative warning, so to speak. Okay. And uh, they're sampling extensively um, and will consider it an established population only when there are live adults found. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. There's a question. What are the considerations regarding the bottom barriers? Why is a land use permit required? Uh, I mentioned a couple of the considerations. One is that um, they can develop gas pockets underneath and start to lift off of the lake bed. Um, so they need to be anchored down appropriately and burped. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, also, the sediment can bury them, and uh, then the plants just grow on top of that, um, almost like a mulch. I can't speak to the history of why Idaho Department of Lands requires a permit, but I certainly understand why, why you might want that. Um, one is accountability, because uh, if, if people are taking the care to, to learn about what is required, then they're most likely not going to maybe litter and leave them unattended and uh, I think uh, that lake bed does belong to the state so um, knowing what is what, what is occurring and how people are, are using that space is, is important. Yeah. Do you know how frequently those are employed on our local lakes here, Coeur d'Alene or Hayden or Pend Oreille? No, I receive a lot of queries mm -hmm. and I haven't seen them in the Coeur d'Alene Lake. Yeah. Um, though I do know that Ben Schofield with the tribe uses them in the vicinity of boat launches and uh, public docks okay. in the lower part of the lake. Yeah, that was my impression as well. I've had a lot of questions about them, but I haven't actually seen any on private property or, you know, I read off the people's private docks on the Coeur right. Lake. I've seen um, several on the lake, on the Pend Oreille River system as they are deployed at drawdown. Pretty easy for folks to do. Yeah. Uh, we have a question going back to the mention of granules that homeowners might apply near their dock. Are they more of a, of a pond application? Would they be more appropriate for that? Um, not necessarily. The, the granules may be appropriate for around your dock. 
However, the advertisements that I were referring to do not allude to the complexity and the planning that's involved before you toss said granules. Um, for instance, whether or not there's water use restrictions to swimming or irrigation, whether or not you need to post notifications for your neighbors, whether or not you actually, depending on the compound, whether you need a pesticide applicator's license, um, and then even further, they may need, because they're discharging a pollutant, um, they may need a permit from Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. None of those things are prohibitive, but they are legal requirements. They do show due diligence and um, it's not as easy as ordering on Amazon and then tossing them overboard. Yeah, and it's my understanding too, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if people have a native plant growing in front of their dock and they just see a weed and they just want to get rid of the weeds and they go through and, and remove those, it could potentially open that space to be taken over by invasives. Is yeah, that thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, so um, if you're doing something like Reiki, which is active, you're going to clear that whole lake bed. And if there is an invasive fragment in the area, there's some really good real estate there for it to take hold. Um, there also are some trade-offs with the benthic barrier, right? Because you're turning what, what used to be an, a vegetated environment into a bare bottom, which means you're not going to have the habitat for fish and you're not going to have the oxygen, the plants breathing the oxygen into the water. There's another question. Does Lake Coeur d'Alene's level control by, <clears throat> by the Post Falls Dam encourage the growth of invasive plant life? I'll have to think about that angle. Um, off the top of my head, I would say no. Um, that said, in the river system, by increasing the lake level, there's maybe more wetland habitat. So more opportunity for um, invasive wetland plants, but there's also more opportunity for uh, native wetland plants. Uh, most of the time when I think about controlling the lake level, I think about their ability to draw it down and expose bear, which is a good um, treatment for something like Eurasian water milfoil or curly lake pondy. <clears throat> Um, we have a comment. I remember algae in Rockford Bay, Kid Island Bay, uh, 50, 50 and more years ago. Is there a significant benthic load of nutrients from previous agricultural land runoff? Can the load be encapsulated? I really like that question, but I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer it. I feel like uh, Dr. Wilhelm or maybe Jamie would have more historical perspective on that question. Uh, I can speak broadly to ag runoff and lawn use practices. When you do um, load up a, a you know, cosmetic lawn with nutrients and it runs into the lake, you're going to fertilize the aquatic life as well. Um, if it's native plants, you might fertilize them to the extent that they're a nuisance. And Kid Island Bay is actually a great example of that, um, where the Elodea, also known as waterweed, it is a native plant and has become quite a nuisance. There's a lot of runoff from land use practices in that area. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. I, I think Jim may want to follow up with uh, one of the limnologists or IDEQ who does some of that nutrient sampling in the area. It's a great question. Yeah. Have the attempts to control the invasive species on Hayden Lake via herbicide applications been as successful as expected? Uh, I, I can speak to one success. Um, there's definitely been a lot of challenges with Hayden Lake. As folks know, uh, the Eurasian water milfoil has hybridized with the, the native northern, creating, um, casually speaking, like a supervillain. <laughs> We did start using a new compound at the end of last year. Uh, I, I mentioned it in, in a photograph. When I was speaking about a photograph in Ponderé, it's called Priscillacor. It's very, very targeted um, and it requires less contact time. So some herbicides uh, need to basically bathe the plant for days 
and others just require a base a short exposure. And Purcellicor fo follows that mechanism, and uh, we've seen great success with the Purcellicor application after one year. Um, and then we did an application again. I want to say August, September. Kind of lose track of time, but recently, and uh, we won't know the full outcome until our post-treatment monitoring, but that was a, a great success story. And especially being able to incorporate that, that new chemistry uh, into our state contract. Oh, there we have it. Jamie's yeah. chiming in to help with Jim's question. So uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, so and Jamie Bruner with Department of Environmental Quality mentioned that DEQ does not have data to draw firm conclusions, but in theory, any time agricultural lands are inundated, there would be a load of nutrients from those soils. So kind of feeds into what you were saying as well. Um, I had a, just kind of a question, I guess, something that I get asked a lot is where the funding from the profits from those invasive sticker, invasive species stickers <laughs> that are on at boats, where the funding goes from those? It turns out I'm probably not the best person to answer that question as a um, biologist, but I'm not sure if we have Nick or, or Lloyd on the webinar. There we go. <laughs> you so, can answer live. Let me see if I can. Uh, the most accurate answer. I have a rendition. So Nick, I believe I can allow you to talk. That is a common question, Marie. Thank you for that. Oh, he has no mic. <laughs> oh, huh. Nick, you could also chat the answer or put it in that question box too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to get the mic in place. I I can toss out a question. I get a lot of questions about the weed rake. I don't know if folks want to raise their hand on this um, and, and how to best use it, when to use it. Um, it it's it also seems like a good solution, as in the magic granules. But there are a lot of caveats. Um, one is that they're not selective. Um, it, Two is that uh, they can uh, they can rip the plants quite a bit, but one of the positives and uh, we found people use them on Hayden Lake is uh, you get instant gratification. I mean, you get that biomass out of the water very quickly, but you have to think about the, the trade offs. Yeah, so Nick is is typing and he says that the invasive sticker fund goes towards prevention, monitoring, outreach activities. And there's also some general fund um, in several federal grants to provide program funding as well. Um, and I did listen to the Invasive Species Council yesterday, and they were talking about how some of that invasive species sticker funding can go to site improvements. Um, and you folks in the area may have noticed that we now have um, more robust mobile offices at our check stations. and. Uh, our inspectors are safer and more comfortable and it just leads to a kind of a more compact and organized process. Yeah. And I should know this, but I don't. Are there stickers required in Washington, a different set of stickers? And maybe Absolutely. Just, okay. yeah. And then Washington voters need our stickers as well. Um, if you're an Idaho resident and you register your watercraft, then that sticker fund is incorporated. You're not going to have a separate sticker but you still need to buy separate stickers for all your non-motorized um, canoes, kayaks, paddle boards. Yeah. Great. Are there any other questions for Kim? I guess I have one more question and I'm not sure um, if you would know the answer to this, but we had a discussion on Tuesday with Rebecca Stevens from the Coeur d'Alene Tribe and Jamie Bruner with Department of Environmental Quality talking about the metals that are in the lake bed sediments. And there's been some, I've heard questions about whether weed removal could potentially disrupt those sediments 
and mix up some of the sediment into the water and potentially re-release metals? Is that something that you know anything about? Uh, I guess I know theoretically about it. Um, I don't know from personal experience, but um, if, if you follow the guidance from Panhandle Health, it is suggesting that you don't manipulate the sediment and you really try to keep it in place. Um, the best harvesting for aquatic invasive plants involves digging into the sediment and lifting that root ball. So we often caution people who are in the Silver Valley um, or with property or that has known contaminated sediments about manipulating sediment. I think theoretically, if you overturn the sediment, there is a chance to liberate some of those heavy metals that were otherwise found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe weighing which is more, which the bigger risk is. <laughs> Exactly. And that's fairly unique to our system. There's, um... yeah. Looks like we have another question here. Um, giant Salvinia is a huge problem in the South. Before I moved, some interesting research was being proposed to find ways to eat it. And I know that's been done with other invasives, more terrestrial like kudzu. Um, yeah. But has anything like that been proposed for local AIS? Uh, that's a great question. And the campaign that some folks follow is the eat them to beat them campaign. Um, people joke about eating some of the Asian mystery snails that are in North Idaho. Um, I don't know if I would do that. Uh, I think folks have escargot of North Idaho. Um, and uh, the crayfish are certainly edible, but to my knowledge, the non-native or crayfish that are in our area are not in high enough abundance to really warrant a harvest. Most people are targeting the native single crayfish, but it's always a great strategy to keep in mind. Um, but we also want to be careful uh, whenever you incentivize invasive species, there's a potential for cultivation. Um, the same goes for bounties or just making the positive. And, and a fun example from last year is actually the Round Lake State park put a bounty on those Asian mystery snails, so to speak, and it was uh, roughly a dozen snails gets you an ice cream. But right. the outreach needed to be accompanied by the caveat that they're not a positive thing. It's not a re they're not, you shouldn't be rewarded for having them. But yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks, George. Um, let's see. There's a comment. I realized recently that the DASH mechanical weed removal method is not, is not selective. Yeah. yeah, thanks for realizing that. It, and a lot of these, when you first hear about them and on the surface, that's, it looks like it's going to be a great solution. But the reality is there is no great solution. <laughs> you just need to be somewhat persistent, uh, very observant about your surroundings, about the natural history of the plant, what else is in the area. Um, and, and devise the best kind of integrated approach. Yeah. Yeah, DASH done in, well, all of these methods done incorrectly can do a whole lot more damage than, than good. Yeah, that's good to know. Any other questions for Kim? Okay, and as Kim said, if you have any questions about a weed that you find, if you think it potentially could be something invasive, you can contact her. And as she was mentioning, it's best to share several different photos of it um, from different perspectives. So I think that's really important for people. Yeah, please don't be shy about that. We, this week we had a complaint from Twin Beaches on Coeur d'Alene Lake and uh, we're gonna investigate it further, but from the specimens that were collected by Idaho Department of Environmental Quality and reviewed by the Coeur d'Alene tribe, it appears that it's the Northern Water Milfoil. But there are many lookalikes, especially when it comes to uh, Eurasian Water Milfoil. Yeah. Um, we had a comment from Nick to like the Invasive Species of Idaho Facebook page, which I have liked and I follow, and I do post really interesting things. I really enjoy that. There's like fun facts every couple of days. So 
So, all right, any other comments or questions for Kim? Okay, well, thank you so much, Kim. We really appreciate your time and uh, really very cool photos in your presentation. That was really oh, nice. <laughs> and very uh, helpful for plant identification. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and thank you everybody for joining. We really appreciate your time. Again, this was the last in this series of presentations, but we are potentially looking into holding another set. So again, if there's any topics that you are especially interested in, please let us know. We would love to, to educate you more about that. And we'd like to learn more about um, whatever topics are, are out there. So um, again, there'll be a short survey at the end. Please fill it out. If you've already filled it out several times, you can skip. Um, all of the recordings of the presentations will be available at our website, uidaho.edu slash our gem. And uh, again, those Coeur d'Alene Press articles that the Our Gem Collaborative has been writing, they're all available on that website as well. So go check those out. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us and hope you have a good afternoon.